Um, so before we start, I want to tell you about something that happened with my housemate, Chloe. Um, I still live with housemates. Um, my housemate, Chloe, just the day before yesterday. Um, and she's a final year med student. Uh, so I came home and I asked her, you know, how's your day? How's hospital? And she said, oh, it was awful. I went to surgery and uh, at 6 a.m. and I didn't have time to eat breakfast. And then um, after surgery, there was like a really urgent audit and I spent three hours um, taking these scans of x-rays and then cropping them and copying them into a file. And it was a really urgent audit, so I didn't have time to eat lunch either. And I looked at her in horror and I was like, but you know, you can do that with programming. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I know, but I can't, right? Um, and I get friends in all sorts of different fields, in media, in doing you know, scientific research, in law, and they, they come to me sometimes and they say, you know, I have to do programming in my job. And um, they always say two things. They, they say, I never realized I need programming in my job. And then they always say, and I really, really, really wish that I'd done it at school, just a little bit, um, so it wasn't so hard. So uh, good news on that front. Uh, the digital technologies <laughs> curriculum is coming. Uh, Bruce talked about this a little bit earlier, so I won't go into it too much, but it's been endorsed uh, last year and it covers kindergarten to year 12 and different states and territories are rolling it out over the next few years. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit more about year seven later. So um, just to give you an idea, the implementation part, so just this is one content descriptor in the curriculum uh, for year seven and eight says that they need to be able to implement and modify programs with user interfaces, so input-output, um, involving branching, iteration, and functions in a general purpose programming language. So this is text-based, um, no more drag and drop. And they have to be able to you know, do if statements, do loops, and write functions. Um, and if you think about you know, a, a year seven student who's never done programming before, this is a really big ask. Um, especially you know, being taught by a teacher who might not have done programming before either. Um, so uh, there are a lot of challenges. And uh, Bruce talked about some of them earlier, but one of the biggest ones is that the curriculum is very crowded. So not just the digital technologies curriculum, um, but the whole curriculum, especially at a primary level. Um, how, how many of you are teachers in the room at the moment? Yep. <laughs> Would you agree? Yep. Um, and it's basically impossible to fit it all in, um, especially the digital technologies um, stuff, unless you're covering it in conjunction with other subject areas. So you're teaching a, a few of the content descriptors at the same time. And often, uh, you know, programming is best taught in context anyway. So very few of the students actually um, will enjoy programming in and of itself. But you know, if you show them that it's a useful and valuable tool um, in the areas that they're interested in and that they will need this in the future, then um, you get a lot better engagement. Um, so this is all very well and good to say, but it's really hard to do in schools because often subjects are siloed. Um, a lot of schools lack you know, experienced teachers and the support in order to implement all this. Um, and you know, with the schools running behind, uh, with, with the states who are running behind, <clears throat> like New South Wales, um, <laughs> we, we really want to be able to reach those students right now, right? The, the earlier they have, you know, a foundation in programming, the better it is, the easier they will find it in the future. I mean, I went to visit my old school this year. Um, it's a girls' school. I won't say which, but I found out that they basically did no programming whatsoever. So they did very little when I attended, but now they've dialed it back. So there's mandatory tech in year seven, but they do food tech and woodwork. And um, they ax the nine and 10 IT subjects, and then they don't offer the, any, any programming subjects in 11 and 12. So this is the kind of stuff that's going on, and it's a snobby private school. So. <laughs> Um, so one possible solution um, that we're exploring at the moment, um, and several teachers came and approached us about this, 
is to teach some programming in math, sneak it into maths class. Um, and these teachers who approached us obviously see the deep connection between math and computer science. Um, and there's also in the new curricula, there's lots of connections between the two. And so it's a really great opportunity for authentic integration, which uh, if we can pull off properly, can really um, engage students like more in both subject areas. So you're going to get the students who don't like maths because they don't see the point of it. You know, all of a sudden they're seeing all these real world applications. And um, the rarer case of the student who really likes, you know, hacking at things but hates maths because what's the point? Um, you can also, you know, uh, engage them as well. Um, the, the flip side of this integration is that it's really hard to do. Um, you need expertise in both subject areas and um, if you're going to teach multiple things at the same time, you have to make sure you're actually teaching both of them. Um, and if it's done kind of in a half-baked way, the students can tell and it won't help with your engagement. Um, so, oh, another interesting thing that's happened is that Victoria has added, has basically extended their maths curriculum to include digital technologies, e um, content descriptors, so exploring algorithms and programming for maths. Um, so what we wanted to do was to develop resources that maths teachers would find valuable um, to use with their maths classes so we could reach more students at an earlier age because, you know, all students do maths up to year 10. Uh, so Right, before, before we go on with this, um, what is this logo slash this turtle thing? So who's, who's heard of logo? Oh, great. <laughs> Preaching to the choir. Um, so it's this educational programming language that was developed uh, in 67. It was really popular in the 60s and 70s. And originally there was this little robot running around and drawing shapes, um, drawing lines. Um, and so the Python turtle module is a re-implementation of this programming language. Um, it's built into the, the Python standard library, so you can just import it. Um, it looks kind of like this. So you import the turtle module, and the turtle starts off in the middle of the screen facing to the, the right. <laughs> um, and uh, you basically move the turtle around, and it will draw a line behind it. Um, and the, the, the syntax is really simple and straightforward. It does what you expect. So if you say forward 100, it'll move forward and draw a line 100 steps long. Um, so just to note, like all the demos I'm going to show you in this talk are in the Grok Learning platform because that's where I work. Um, but Python is available, sorry, the, the total module is available um, for free. You know, it's part of the standard library. and Everything I'm showing you, I'm going to show you is also available to teachers for free. And then you can just take the problems. You're, you're, really, you're more than welcome to take the problems and then do them with your students um, in class with them running Python locally. So yeah, just email me if you want to do that. Cool. So um, before, the, the first thing we did was um, we wanted to experiment and see if this was an idea that would actually work. Um, so we decided to put... Um, some some total problems into an existing competition. So uh, I think some of the teachers have talked about the NCSS challenge. It's this competition we run annually on behalf of the University of Sydney. And uh, in the beginner's stream, there are eight problems per week. And we decided to make the last two of them uh, total problems that would also sneakily teach you geometry <laughs> and see if the students noticed. <laughs> Um, so that year, 2015, we had about 6,000 students and 500 teachers participating. Um, and I'm going to do a little demo. Let's see. How does this happen? Cool. So the first week, um, we told them about angles. <laughs> so, okay, so you're making the turtle move forward. Um, but as soon as you want to draw a shape, you, you need to turn the turtle. And so right off the bat, we've um, got this concept of angles as a change in direction of the turtle. So you've, you've tethered this concept of angles to this real thing that happens. Um, 
So you know that turning a corner is 90 degrees. Right. Cool, and now you've drawn part of a square. Um, but actually, if you want to draw anything besides a square or a rectangle, you start needing to do angle calculations. So say I want to draw a, an equilateral triangle. Um, so if I'm a student, I'll go along and think, OK, so the angle in an equilateral triangle is 60 degrees. So I'm going to turn left, go forward, turn left. This will work, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's happened? Um, so the, the angle that the turtle needs to turn is not the same angle as the internal angle of the triangle. So you then need to start thinking about the relationships between those angles. And, um, you know, supplementary angles are useful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's in the first week. In the second week, we hit them with angles and parallel lines. And this is in the Year 7 maths curriculum. Um, and even just having this interactive diagram and being able to see, you know, the different pairs of angles and how it changes, but, you know, they stay the same when you move, move it around. Um, it's a different way of presenting that information to students. And the final problem in this week was actually really hard. So <laughs> the problem was um, the user would enter an angle and then you would have to draw a T that was tilted by that amount. So if the angle's 90, it's a, it's a regular T with 90 degree angles. But if the T, if, if the user enters a different angle, um, you need to italicize the T, right? How, how many of you are confident in doing this question if I asked you to come on? <laughs> um, oh, I don't, I was gonna try and do this, but I don't think I have enough time which is uh, good for me. <laughs> but um, what's often useful with this is that um, a lot of the time we tell the student, you know, draw it on a piece of paper, like draw the dotted line where the, the turtle would keep moving and, you know, you know like mark out the angles that you need to turn. And when you draw it out, it looks a lot like those boring, you know, parallel line diagrams that you're, you're drawing in maths class, but all of a sudden it has a purpose. You know, you need it to italicize, you know, vector fonts. Um, <laughs> so week three, we've got angles at a point. And at this point, um, they've learned looping in terms of programming concepts. So they're using uh, a for loop to draw squares around a point and they need to do the angle calculation uh, to figure out how much to turn after each square. Uh, week four, exterior angles of a polygon. Um, did you know exterior angles of a polygon add up to 360 degrees? <laughs> you can remember it because in order to get the turtle back around to where it started, you need to turn the whole circle of 360 degrees. Um, Oh, and this is my favorite question. So coordinates and the number plane. Um, so this is getting pretty advanced at this point. I don't think coordinates, I don't think the number plane comes in until year eight or nine. Um, but in this problem, we're basically giving them some coordinates and we're asking them to draw it on one side and then flip it across the y-axis. So they have to make the x-coordinate negative. Um, and the cool thing with this problem is um, that, you know, you can just give them coordinates and with the same solution, they're drawing really cool shapes. Um, and I've got the solution in here because I did this one. <laughs> Spent two hours of my life. Um, so at this point, <laughs> The students are using, I mean, so they've got, they're reading a string, they need to break it up into an array, they're looping over it. Um, and then at the same time, they need to understand these maths concepts with the, the, the number plane, right? And so we're getting um, pretty advanced and it's a real marriage of the two subject areas that creates like a really interesting and challenging problem. Um, so, that was the challenge that year. And we had, how do I full screen this again? 
Cool. Um, so that was half of the problems. So we had 10 problems total, two, two problems a week over five weeks. Um, so let's see what the students thought. <laughs> it was amazing. I love programming to make shapes and pictures, but don't ask me to redo them because they were very hard to work out how to do. <laughs> 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 it felt nice when I got them right because I'm weak at maths. This was um, a response that we really wanted to hear, and it was very nice. Um, I would much rather write other programs or stab forks in my eyes than do any more turtle questions. <laughs> uh, that is also a fair response. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so overall, um, we had 388 students respond to the survey question about whether they like the turtle questions. And the answer overall is, yeah. Um, so what did the teachers think? Uh, Rob said it was engaging, more enjoyable, as you could see when incorrect instruction was drawn out with a turtle. So you're visually seeing um, what's gone wrong rather than like a cryptic error message. Um, as much as I like them, students tended to get hung up on the mathematics of the questions rather than the programming. And at the beginner level, this often causes students to get disheartened with the programming side of things. So this was a really common concern we had um, about the difficulty of the maths or even students' negative perceptions of maths, um, you know, turning them away from the programming as well. Um, so, okay, Lou said, personally, I hated the turtle, but that's because I couldn't get my mind around it. It was great for students, however, and our head of maths found some great connections with vectors and angles, um, which is good because that's what we were going for. So overall, um, this was 80 teachers who responded to this question, and they liked the turtle questions more than the students did. Nobody hated it. <laughs> um, oh, and also on the survey, uh, I think 18 students said that they didn't realize they had been doing maths. So <laughs> we, <laughs> we got them. Um, so overall, what we learned um, is generally positive. Um, this problem about the maths being too hard was aggravated by the large range of ages that we have participating in the beginners challenge. So I think five to 12. Um, and this works right now for programming. It works ish because, you know, lots of students in five to 12 have exactly the same amount of experience programming, which is zero. Right. But this isn't the case with maths. Um, there's a really clear sequence um, and it's, you know, taught in schools from a young age. Um, so what we wanted to do next was develop um, resources that were just for a specific um, year. So um, a year seven maths course. And we had 59 teachers on the survey say they'd be interested in working with um, colleagues to trial this course. So we took that as a sign to go ahead. Um, so this year seven maths course. Um, this is released online, free for teachers, so you can go on and check it out, um, but you'll need to request a teacher trial, so you can't do it right at the moment. Um, but yeah, just email me if you want access. Um, so we made a few decisions about the course based on the feedback we got. Um, it was targeted at Year 7, and it was tied to both the maths and the digital technologies curriculum um, for Year 7. And we uh, explicitly teach the math concepts more. So in the challenge, it was more of a case of using um, math concepts to solve programming problems. Uh, and in this course, it's more using programming to explore math concepts. Right? Um, and we slowed it right down. So uh, the first two weeks of the challenge, basically, we expanded out into six modules. Uh, we doubled up the problems, and um, it only covers, the programming covers basically, um, you know, input, output, variables, you know, strings and num ints and um, if statements. So that's how far we got in those six modules. And when we developed the course, we actually had a really enthusiastic um, maths teacher who wanted to try it out with his entire year seven cohort. Um, so this was 91 students across four classes. And, but the four math teachers, um, I don't think any of them had any big experience coding. And we went into the school and we met with them a few times and um, ran them through the courses. But you know, teachers very busy and they didn't have time to do to prep that either. So the classes ended up um, completing 
one to three modules over three periods, um, depending on the level of the class. And if you, I mean, if you look at the progression, um, a lot of, so the first two modules are basically just, you know, the basics of programming, getting input from the user, how to time things together using Python. Um, so that means a lot of the students didn't even actually get to the, the turtle bit, um, which is a bit sad. And then they, you know, uh, had assessments that they needed to do and they were worried about the time, um, you know, how much time they had left to teach maths because they thought it didn't have enough maths in it, which is totally fair. Um, so it's really hard to do any interesting problems when you don't have that grounding, um, that basic foundation in programming. And this will get better in the future as more students, you know, go through the curriculum and start programming from a younger age. But right now, um, it, it's not helping. So maths teachers are concerned about not getting enough time to teach their curriculum. Um, and getting the balance right is really hard, uh, but we're trying. <laughs> um, Let's see, so what's happening right now is that we released the course on the website last week um, and we emailed teachers to see if they'd be interested in, in trying that with more students. Um, and so we had maybe a dozen um, teachers email back so far and we've got two new classes signed up. And the difference in this, these cases is that it's interested maths teachers or, you know, um, people contacting us on behalf of, you know, their interested maths colleagues. Um, so the maths teachers themselves are going to, those teachers themselves are going to be delivering the content to their students. So hopefully that'll work a little bit better. And on our end, I'm working to, you know, shift the balance towards maths even more um, because we, we really want math teachers to find it valuable for teaching their curriculum as well. Um, and what we need to do is just slow down the, the programming and, um, you know, for, for the current situation and then just adapt it as students get more, gain more experience in younger years programming. Um, cool. So, I guess this is what I talked about, um, digital technologies needs integration. So the, the main summary point I had here was that through this whole process, working with teachers has really been invaluable because obviously I'm not out in the schools teaching and I'm not a maths teacher. Um, so if you know you want to, um, if you're interested in any of this or if you have a similar experience um, integrating you know, across subject areas, I'd really like to hear from you. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Do we have questions? Thanks, Vivian. Um, I saw the clear application of looping. What about tests? As in ifs? Where were they in right. the um, turtle? So things like, uh, let me show you, naming angles. So where are we going? Uh, no? Right. I'm a bit. So things like um, naming angles or I think we're drawing angles at a, in different colours depending on whether they're okay. obtuse or yeah. acute. Um, yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Oh, at the back. back. So I had a couple of questions. Um, first, with the survey results of these students with the challenge, um, was that just of all students or were you able to get a gender breakdown of results? For, uh, um, yeah, so we, we do have a gender breakdown. Um, let me see if I can, I took their names off, but let me see if I can remember who they came from. Um, if you're interested, I can show you more feedback. I mean, we had like 300, 400 responses. Um, and I just pick some out. Um, the first one was male. The second one was female. And I didn't check the third one. <laughs> 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 and, and I was also um, 
oh, wondering, are you um, considering doing similar integrated courses, um, curricula for younger students as well? Um, that's, I think it's further down the roadmap. Um, with the textbook, so the other thing that we have done is we've got um, turtle programming using Blockly, so you've got drag and drop blocks instead, um, and that works really well with younger students, so we've got a couple of activities that use that. Cool. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you.